I am Stephanie Ruiz, the other half of the Ruiz team. Um, I'm the lead developer for the UI component framework for design systems for Salesforce, and I've been doing that for about 18 months. And then about six months ago, I recruited him, and I'll let him tell you what. I got the referral fee, you guys. It was awesome. Yeah, it's cool. We, we were able to go to Costco one more time that month. Yes. Never, never a bad thing. My name is Greg Rose. I'm a principal developer evangelist, uh, as Stephanie was saying. I focus on all things front end, um, and at Salesforce, that now means lightning components. So that is what I spend my day uh, um, doing is talking about and building lightning components. And in order to make them look, my own personal custom components, to make them look like the Salesforce platform, I use the Salesforce Lightning design system. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> now, if anybody has been to sales, a Salesforce presentation before, which I know you've probably already seen a session, a session that has this, you know what this is, right? What does this mean? <laughs> exactly. Especially us. You it's, especially don't want to make Let me just say, decisions. if you were to make a purchasing decision based on something in a CSS presentation, you really ought to talk to your therapist because there's something wrong. Now, I would like to know who they are. All right, so... Uh, so uh, how who, many of you are like developer developers, like you get in there and you're doing all the apex and the craziness? Wow, cool. Ooh, cool. How all many right, of you have played with the design system so far? Cool. No, 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 wait. I saw a developer raise their hand to say they'd played with it. Developers don't do that, do they? They copy-paste it. They copy-paste, <laughs> that's right, exactly. And how many of you are admins? Your admin track has made you into a developer. So, and, okay, so what are the rest of you? Admelopers, what do they call them? Adminipers? Ad <laughs> do both? Do both. All a little right. bit of both? Cool. All right. Very cool. Excellent. Very cool. Good mix. All right, I am going to ask a question, and then I'm going to step away. And that is, 18 months ago, I watched you begin to, oh, by the way, um, we go back one. Um, I just <laughs> meant to point out, uh, we do have Twitter handles. Uh, Stephanie is Steph Saul. I'm at Garazi, if you would like to follow us. Um, we do uh, appreciate nice, positive, healthy, happy tweets. Like, this session is awesome. Anything? And if it isn't, be very quiet. Exactly, be very quiet. Um, <laughs> if you do follow us, we have been known to tweet at each other from opposite ends of the couch. So just be forewarned. It's, All right. it's a little annoying. And about 18 months ago, we were tweeting back and forth a lot <coughs> because Stephanie had started at Salesforce building the Lightning Design System. The first question I had was, why? So I'm going to let you talk about that, and I'll be back up in a bit. All right. Well, since most of you are admins or developers or some blend of the two, you probably know how ginormous the Salesforce ecosystem is. And we have so many clouds. And we acquire companies. We just acquired a new one, as you know. And what they have in common is they are clouds. And they're all building their own CSS. They're coming from different places. They're usually written by engineers that would probably rather be writing Java or something more fun than UI CSS. And so because of all these different stacks, I mean, why did we need a design system, right? We needed to coordinate all that. And the need was compounded by the fact that for the first time in 17 years, we were really overhauling the entire UI as well as a lot of other things, creating the Lightning experience. And Lightning was a huge, really well thought out endeavor. It was a huge change, it touches lots of things, but in a company this size, with the large amount of external and internal developers, you can imagine what it took to align all of this. And so, with these hundreds of developers, small team of designers, we have a smaller design systems team, and that's the team that I entered to actually do something about this UI portion. Our code base had probably been around before that since maybe Bill Clinton was president. Um, so we needed some way to get all our clouds and the myriad of coding styles in line. We had, uh, in 2013, we had launched Salesforce One, and that was a really big step. Those of you that were around then, that was kind of a big thing. We also, at the same time, the design systems team took a big step toward a living style guide. And it was a really good step, and it was the right direction. 
But at Dreamforce 2014, our team had the chance to really go and talk to lots of customers and hundreds of partners. And what we heard was very interesting. We found out that many partners want their apps to look like Salesforce, but our static guide didn't really give them the resources to get there. And we also found that partners were reverse engineering our CSS to try to match our style. You know, inspect element in the browser, grab all the CSS classes, hope you get the, the cascade in the right order and put it back together. And we realized that most developers really wanted probably a good copy paste and forget all this reconstruction. We also believe in eating our own dog food, so we want to empower our own internal designers and give them tools to more quickly innovate and prototype. We do a ton of prototyping and testing rapidly. And we have the lofty goal of eventually having our designers really um, design in the browser. We, um, we were doing a campfire after this, Zunka and I, and um, we have a little tool to help people design in the browser that we're going to show, but it's going to be hard down there. We found out there's no screen. So we're going to show it to you on a, on a, if you're interested on a laptop, you can come down there. Anyway, what we learned was that we needed a more complete living design system. Um, this lightning design system was our evolution to try to meet all of those desperate, disparate, disparate, desperate needs. It's made of a uh, bunch of numerous pieces. We have design guidelines and patterns. We have a mobile SDK. We've got icons and tokens. But for today, we're going to concentrate on the CSS framework part of the design system. So with design system UI components, we allow re developers to reference actual code and even copy and paste, which Greg will be demonstrating his amazing prowess at later. He's really good at it. <laughs> the whole project began with a design audit. And this was the stage where I came into the picture. I got to see this audit happening. And this audit involved gathering all of our multiple designers' comps and then taking an inventory of all the components that had been designed by tons of different teams. And you can imagine the font sizes and shades of blue and different padding and spacing and you know, different things, lots of inconsistency, similar but inconsistent. And so design patterns were established for the fonts and spacing and colors and sizing to standardize and align all of this. And then to make it more scalable and resilient, we turn these standardized values into something we call tokens. Now, some of you may have heard of these tokens. They've been around for a couple of years. They're essentially constants. If you've used SAS or LESS at any point, they're equivalent to a variable. Um, tokens store the value of specific properties. And these are some of the properties we've abstracted out. So when you're using tokens within your own CSS classes, it looks something like this. You, um, you can use them within the Lightning platform. Um, all of the uh, RCSS is now in core, so um, the tokens are available there as well. You'll use the format you see here. It's a T with uh, token name in parentheses. And this assures you that if Salesforce changes a bit of the look, let's say one day we decide we're going for that flat square look and we take away all the rounded border radius corners on things. If you've used tokens, you're component is going to just inherit those changes, and you will continue to look like you fit right into the ecosystem that we've created. Now, our design audit, alignment, and tokens allowed us to begin to build more efficient CSS. So as we inventoried these components, we were able to identify the pieces or patterns which make up the component itself. And to begin, we broke those down as small as we could. I like to call these tiny pieces micro patterns. So let's look how, at how we identify those. So what do you see in this picture? When you look at this picture, what do you see? Just shout it out. What, what do you see? I like that a lot of you, I like that nobody said I see a house. People are picking out little pieces. That's good, a house. I, I, I do like that you're picking out little pieces, so you're getting where I'm going with this, because it isn't just a house. If we look at it as a house component, we can see the pieces and the patterns that it's made of. So we have these three similar structures. We have, if we break them down further, all three have roofs with a triangular pattern. Going deeper, each pattern in the roof also has a window. Somebody said windows, good for you. Because we can break this down to even the smallest micro pattern or the boards that build the structure. 
And then the three structures are connected by two smaller, narrow structures. Each of these patterns also has a window. In fact, windows are a smaller piece of several of the patterns that we see in this house. Even windows can be broken into smaller component parts. We have the panes, we have the, the portion that sticks them all together. And there are four identical columns in front of the house, and there are a variety of similar lighting uh, structures as well. When we pull all of these micro patterns together, we get the overall building. So you can see how many pieces are put together to create this house component. So let's look at how this works in some real world examples. This is a detail panel, and it's constructed from a variety of micro patterns. Buttons and button icons are some of the smallest patterns in the system. And since this is an application, you as developers are expected to use the proper semantic heading. Where it's needed, we, don't, uh, we are agnostic about what heading you use because it should be accessible in the proper one. So we've created text utilities to create consistent styling. So this is a page from the site showing our text utilities. They provide all the sizing needed for any component within the Salesforce ecosystem. So every, everything you'll see within the Lightning experience is contained right here. There's no reason to write any CSS on your own. And the interesting thing is, because we're dealing in applications, we, headings don't usually need any margin or padding in an application. You tend to stay pretty tight, so we just take it away. And all the headings are equalized to one rem, or that's equal to the HTML element. In our case, will be 16 pixels. So if you were to use an H1 or you were to use an H5 without a, a text helper, they would look identical. This is to encourage you to use the proper heading and then use a class on it to make it look the way it should in the part of your component you're using it in. So forms are another micro pattern starting with the label and inputs, and then combining them into a form element component that can be used in a variety of contexts. The same DOM that we use to create this little form section can be used for inline forms, horizontal forms, stacked forms, anything. It's all the same DOM. Another example is pills. You can see an outline here around the pill container. The pill is built of smaller patterns like icons and button icons. And we have a variety of those patterns available. So for example, we've got pills. You can see we've got five varieties. This is the portrait variant. So let's look at a related list card for a few more patterns. Again, we can see the buttons and button icons and then regular icons, which are different things. Buttons are actionable, regular icons are not. And here's an outline of the grids included in this component pattern. Grids are your glue for your component, and we'll look at those in more detail because they're really important. Another thing you see a lot in applications is a media object. And a media object is just an image, an icon, a video, whatever, sitting next to text. Very, very common in applications. But in most cases, um, you'll just basically put these SLDS classes on. Um, you can see that there is a body, media body, and a media um, figure. And then you've got the media object itself. It's just three parts. This is the page. The really interesting thing is this utility will allow you to align the text to the top of the image, to the middle of the image. You can put the image on either side of the text. You can put it on both sides of the text. And all of that is done with a single extra class. Now, in applications, lists rarely require list markers. So just like in headings, we removed all the list markers. You don't have to go into your component and say UL margin zero, padding zero, list style none. We've done all that for you. So we've given you a wide variety of list utilities so you can organize your content. Um, this is an example of some of the horizontal utilities that have um, dividers. We've got dividers with spacing. We've got vertical ones. Um, there's a whole host of this in our utility section of our site. And it, these patterns that we created are not special snowflakes. They are the patterns that are within the Lightning experience. The utilities I've been referring to are found under the components menu of the SLDS site. This is the left one. Down in the bottom, you can see from the list there are a wide variety of utilities. You can use them for floating, for visibility, for other commonly needed functionality. There's no need to create yet another display none rule. You, you don't need to do that. 
Greg will show you exactly how to utilize these in a minute. And then at the bottom of each component or utility page, there's a component overview table that explains the various classes and what the outcome is that they will produce. So when you look at this component overview, if you, I don't know if you can see that text. It might be a little too small. But all of the classes in SLDS, uh, the design system, begin with a namespace. So they start with .sLDS dash, and then the name of the class. And that's so that you can mix this framework with anything. You might have your own bespoke CSS that you're using. You might be using the old Bootstrap version um, that we had that is no longer maintained. Um, and you might be trying to change things over. So this means that when you create a button and you put the dot button class, say for Bootstrap, ours will be dot SLDS dash button, and the styles will not clash. So it keeps everything safe. Now, we've chosen to use very explicit naming for clarity. It can be a little verbose at times. And we use very few abbreviations because we feel that clarity is more important than teeny tiny two-letter class names. So we want you to understand exactly what you're doing. We also use a naming style called BIM. And if you're unfamiliar, with BIM, we define class names based on function. Are they a block, an element, or a modifier? BIM makes it a lot easier for a group of developers, which includes both internal and external developers, that are working on the same project to understand the purpose of a class immediately when you look at it. So let me show you an example. Going back to our house example from earlier, let's build a little house component. So the class house is our main component. This is the block or the component name. An element or a component part is separated with two underscores. So we start with the component name house, and then you can see if you underscore door or underscore window, you're pointing to the door of the house or the window of the house. You can see that immediately. A modifier is separated with two dashes. So since we have a gray house, we have our house dash dash gray, which tells you we're talking about modifying the gray color of the house. And then we can also have variations of component parts. So since our house is a fuchsia door, you can see how we have extended the pattern, house underscore underscore door dash dash fuchsia. Very simple to understand. And so when you're working in another developer's code or when you're working in our code, you can understand immediately how this all relates. Also, these single classes keep our code base flatter. We're using very little descendant selectors. Um, we're trying to avoid specificity wars where everybody makes it more and more and more specific until somebody says, important and then everybody else loses, right? <laughs> so we're trying to keep this very maintain, maintainable. So you'll see us ex using a base um, component name and then extending it with modifiers. So we've looked at naming and micro patterns. So let's actually look at the fact that in some cases, we've compiled entire components. Um, and variations of components. So in this case, this is our page headers. Um, this is page headers for record home, object home, related list pages. Um, these are a living spec or a blueprint for you to build things from. Um, I also want to mention that nearly all our components and micro patterns are built to be responsive. So that means their width is going to be controlled by their parent container. So if you want it to be the full width of the page, great. If you want to contain it in a large part of the page or a small part of the page, you'll drop it in there. Um, one of the other thing to be aware of is though our spec examples show a class on a specific element in our examples, usually that element doesn't matter. If your DOM is using a different element, that's usually okay. It's the class that matters. And if it does matter, let's say for accessibility, it's important that we're using a list or a very specific element, we will tell you that in the uh, documentation. So I want to talk a little bit. I told you about the grids. Um, the grids are really powerful within SLDS. And we've been able to utilize something called Flexbox. How many of you have worked with Flexbox before? It's a fairly new, OK, yeah. It's super awesome. It's the newest CSS box model optimized for interface design. And it can be responsive at any width. You can have perfect vertical alignment. How many times have you fought with vertical alignment? Yeah, the order and direction can be changed. White space isn't a, a problem like with inline block. 
Um, you can control the way items react to each other and how much space they occupy. So these grids are super powerful. We use it for a variety of other components as well, our media objects, inline lists. There's a whole lot of things that we use Flexbox for. But right now, we're just going to talk about how it applies to grids. So the SLDS grid system is a very flexible, mobile-first, device-agnostic scaffolding system. And you'll find it in the utilities section of the components, as we mentioned earlier. Some of the advantages of Flexbox grids are you can have automatic or manual sizing, depends on your needs. You can manipulate direction without changing the DOM. You can nest all you want, which is great. So let's look at how we initialize a grid. The grid class can be initialized on literally any ele element. It can be on a div, can be on a UL, can even be on a span, doesn't matter. And whatever element you place that grid class on, it will become the flex parent of all the children inside. Once you've initialized the grid row, you have a library of helpers. And I encourage you to go really explore. Uh, there is a huge number of helpers that we've given you to extend and make these grids work. They'll modify the grid container. They'll modify the individual grid items. And we try to use verbose, friendly, human-readable classes. So let's look at an example of how easy it is to turn a grid row, because by default, Flexbox runs in a row into a column by using a single additional class. So remember, we additionally put on the SLDS grid. And by extending it with the SLDS grid dash dash vertical, meaning, meaning what? Variation, right? So we've made a variation which is saying we want this grid to be vertical. Now, this grid will flow from top to bottom. You can actually, with Flexbox, make it go from bottom to top or from right to left as well. So it's, it does some pretty crazy things. Let's look at another useful grid helper. By default, the grid items don't wrap. So if you use automatic sizing, they'll all squish to fit into their parent, the parent, which is the row. And if you give grids manual sizing, so you give it an explicit width, you can cause them to exceed the width of the parent. And I don't know if you can see it here, but right around column five, there's a gray background. That's the whole parent, that gray background. And they just bust on out. They're just going to keep going because they don't wrap by default. So we give you a class called SLDS wrap that you put on the grid parent. And that just says, when you run out of space, wrap and go to a second row. So this is a very handy, very, very useful class. So let's look at some of the items contained in a grid. By default, all direct children of a grid are grid items. You, don't, you notice we put it on the UL. We don't have a thing on the LIs, but they are inheriting, and they are grid children. Any direct child, not grandchild, but any direct child. So, and by default, they display in order from left to right. And they don't stretch to take up the available space on the main axis. They take up as much room as they need. They remain horizontally aligned. But you can tell the parent runs much farther than the children are filling. In some cases, that's great, and that's all you want. But what if you want the grid items to stretch and fill the whole row? You can apply a class called SLDS call. It's not required to apply that class, but it will give you that automatic sizing. And what that class actually does is it applies a declaration, and it says flex 1-1 one, one auto. That's shorthand for flex 1, shrink 1, and use auto sizing. And so that's what gives it this auto sizing to fill the row and stretch to fill the main axis. Now, the initial SLDS call class provides the most helpful base uh, for the application of other grid utility classes. It's something you'll probably want to use a lot. So if you have two grid items with equal content, they'll look like this. But since the width of each grid item is automatic, it's determined by the content within the region. So in this second example, you can see that the left side is wider than the right side because it contains more content. But there may be times when you want a single grid item to have a different behavior than the rest. So we give you modifiers that give you additional functionality, and they can, you can add this to single grid items. Maybe you want a single grid item to grow or to shrink more than the rest. Maybe you want it to have a different alignment, align it to the top, the bottom, the middle. Or maybe we don't want the grid item to flex at all. In that case, you can use the SLDS noFlex class, and 
on that one grid item, it will not stretch or sh shrink. It simply displays the content in the grid. So for example, a good use case where we use this a lot is if you've got a component with a header and a title, whatever, and then on the side you've got a button or an icon, and you don't want that button or icon to stretch or shrink or get out of, out of shape. You can set no flex on the icon or button, and it will stay true to the size, and your header will take up the rest of the space that it needs. So that is something very handy. You'll see this a lot within the framework. So let's look at what happens when we switch from automatic sizing to manual sizing. Automatic sizing of grid items is really awesome, but sometimes you want to be very specific and very uniform about the width of your column regions. So we've made sizing helpers for this. The sizing helpers are created from a specific pattern, pretty easy to follow along with. We start with the sizing term, so you can see SLDS size. Then your column span numerator. In this case, it's a one. Then your human-friendly delimiter of. And then your total column denominator. In this case, it's a three, so we're looking at thirds. So logically, the class here, SLDS size one of three, outputs the grid item at 33%. A very, very specific 33%, because we always have to be accounting for those silly browser rounding differences, right? So take it to 8 or 10. Now let's look at a way we can set the sizing differently for different viewports. We call them responsive sizing utilities. So though we have a lot of different utilities for you know, 1 of 2, 1 of 3, 1 of 4, 1 of 6, 8, 12, I believe, we actually, you might want to size things differently at different viewports. We've baked the responsive part in with a breakpoint name. Pretty simple. You'll find the sizing, again, in our utilities. Both the regular and responsive are here. And because we take a mobile first approach, we define the smallest viewport first. And when we write our media queries, we write them using min widths. So that way, you add additional classes to modify widths for wider viewports. So here are the sizes we provide. You'll, you'll have a default size, and you've got extra small, small, medium, and large. Translates to the form factors you see here. And the format of these classes is similar to what you've already seen. So you simply add the additional breakpoint name to the sizing class. So where we initially had SLDS size 1 of 3, we'll have the size modifier prior to the word size. And that'll give us SLDS large size 1 of 3 or SLDS small size 2 of 5, whatever you need. When you're using the responsive sizing, you'll always start with a default class that has no modifier. So you'll have one class that will just be straight up, I want everything to be this size until I tell it not to be. So that from the smallest to the point where you put on this responsive um, uh, sizing, it will be that size. So we have, uh, with the mobile first, we have four override sizes. And you only add, you don't want to add all of these if you only want to add the ones you want to change. So let's look at what an actual class looks like. In this example, the default uh, class is set to size one of one. So from the smallest, it'll be a column, essentially, one of one. We only want to change the elements width at the small and medium breakpoints. So small will be rendered at one of two. And anything larger than medium, so medium and up, will be rendered at one of four. So this translates to 100% width, width up to a phone or phone and above, 50% between a phone and a tablet, and 25% width on a tablet and up. So in reality, the code you would use would look more like this. All four grid items have the responsive sizing classes applied. Since we want the grid items to wrap, we've added the SLDS wrap class to the grid container. And they will now wrap when their widths exceed the available container area, so depending on what they need at the viewport. So here's the base or default view. It'll be the one column stacked. And the small view will be a two grid layout. It'll wrap after two columns and just keep wrapping. And then the medium or larger view will create a four column layout, no matter how large it gets. So we created a code pen to let you play around with the responsive sizing and the grids. And uh, there's going to be a link to that in this uh, session if you want to get the slides later. But let me just show you kind of how it looks. This is just really me taking the code pen and squishing it and taking a picture for you since I didn't want to jump out in the browser. This is the default, default view example. And the top row contains three flex items that are using automatic sizing. They have no explicit sizing set. So the rest of the grid items are explicitly sized. 
and they're set to one of one in the default view. And then for the small view, we don't change any sizes, but you can see that they just resize with the container. In the medium view, you can see that some of the items are starting to divide themselves up. They're dividing differently based on their responsive classes. And notice that the top row with the automatic sizing is still equally divided in three divisions. And then, of course, we continue this all the way up to the large desktop view. So as I mentioned, we have the code pen. You can play around with this. It's a really fun playground to get your feet wet and fork it and change things. And, and I think you'll learn a lot about the grid system. Now I'm going to turn it over to Greg to talk about how you can make real lightning components out of all these micro patterns in the design system. And we're going to do something weird here. We're going to try to switch the mic, so give us a second. I think so. All right. Can you hear me? Up. Oh, sweet. All right. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Um, feel free to take the mic and chime in. Oh. <laughs> You'll need to turn it on. All right, so I'm going to move on from there. I'm just gonna actually switch my screen for a moment because I'm gonna be doing a demo here, so there we go. All right, so SLDS, cool thing? Yeah? yeah? All right, how do I now take what Stephanie has built and apply that as a Lightning Components developer? And that's the big question. There are four different ways, if you will, all right? When we talk about building SLDS into our experience with Lightning Components, because Lightning Components can go four different places. We can have Lightning Components that are in Lex, or the Lightning Experience, right? So that is with, how many of you saw the keynote this morning? All right, summer 16. Record home, woo, all right? If I want to put a, build my component, I want to put it on a record uh, home page, that's what we're talking about. I'm putting it into the Lightning experience. Now, some of us don't have that luxury. Some of us still have to uh, build with Visual Force. But we can now take Lightning components and put Lightning components into Visual Force. If you're doing that, there's a different way that we need to build. And then Lightning components in, in a Lightning app. Now, when I say Lightning app, Believe me, this, this always starts a discussion. This even starts a discussion internally at Salesforce where we all go, are you, which app are you talking about? Are you talking about Salesforce, the Lightning Experience? Are you talking about an app that you built that's a full-on standalone app, right? So when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about what, something we affectionately called a my.app. So this is not one.app. One.app is the Salesforce Lightning Experience. My.app is I've built a full-on standalone app application. If I'm doing that, there's a different way that I want to approach in, uh, including SLDS. And then finally, taking a Lightning component and using it just somewhere, like you saw in the uh, demo this morning in the, in the keynote, using it inside of a native mobile application. I can do that now with Lightning Out. But each one of these approaches, as I said, are going to mean that you have to do something different. Now, let's talk about that first one the Lightning component in the Lightning experience. How many of you have already built a Lightning component and used SLDS? A shocking number of hands, five. <laughs> oh, no. All right. So if you've done that, then you recognize this guy, right? This guy is the Lightning Require Statement. I just shortened it. I didn't put anything else on there. But the Lightning Require Statement. Lightning Require is the tag or, or instruction, as I like to call it, that tells the component when it's loaded into the page or tells the framework when it's loaded into the page, dude, I need this thing. I can do Lightning Requires for style sheets. I can do Lightning Requires for JavaScripts and so on. So this is what we've been doing up to now. We've been saying Lightning Require and then style equals and then whatever the static resource is that points to SLDS. So you had to go through, let's, um, let's call it hoop jumping to be nice. You had to go through a little bit of hoop jumping to go to the Lightning Design Systems page, to find the resources, to then go scroll down to the bottom and say, I want it. Install it into my org as a static resource so that I can begin using it. Did you notice how I started talking in the past tense? Did you pick up on that? Because now you don't do that anymore. 
because now when we build lightning components that are going into the lightning experience, right? So we're customizing a record home page or something like that is going in on inside of one dot app as we call it. I do absolutely nothing and I inherit all the goodness of SLDS. Hey, woo, that's pretty cool. Now, for all of the other ones, those other three, here's a forward-looking statement. <laughs> Currently, you still need to include a static resource, which means that lightning requires. So here you can see that I'm saying lightning requires style equals resource at my scope, blah, 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 lightning design system dot CSS. Now, the really tuned in people among you might say, my scope, what is that? You see, previously, if you had gone through, well, actually, not even previously, right now, if you go over to Trailhead and do some of the Trailheads, it's going to tell you, you go do the static resource, and you download it, and it says, you install it in your org, it says SLDS, uh, let's say 103, or whatever the version is that, that uh, happened to be current at that time. It says, that's what you see. You see slash resource slash SLDS 103, because that's the way it was installed into your org. This is because the SLDS team, when they were building out SLDS, they included something called scoping. Scoping simply means that we want to protect each other from each other. Because if I've got a component and I want to put my component on the page and I am building with SLDS 103, I want to make sure that when it goes to version 572, that they haven't changed all the buttons that I had my beautiful Salesforce blue. They've changed them all, and they're now a, I don't know, we've, we've changed it to a dark blue or a green or whatever. In other words, we want to protect each other. We want to, we want to bake in what we have done as a design. Now, that's the, that's the impetus, if you will, for scoping. The problem is that up to now, it's, everything has been scoped to SLDS. So in order to make things work, and you'll again see this still in your trailheads, you, you were told to wrap everything that was going to be using SLDS in, in, in a container. It didn't matter what it was, but let's say div my cla uh, the class equals SLDS. Well, in having some very long discussions about how developers work and how they're implementing SLDS, we talked about how could we find a way to protect each other from each other while still giving the flexibility of using SLDS, and we came up with an idea of scoping to your own namespace. So that way, my company is using my version of a, of a static resource, and you can use yours. We can mix and match them on the page, but imagine if we had both used SLDS. Then I was including SLDS 103, and you were including 572. Guess what? I get 572 because my, or I or they get 103. It just depends on who loaded first in the beautiful CSS. Yes. So we didn't want to do that. So that's why we said let's actually break it out and make you be able to scope to whatever you would like. Now the problem with that is how do you know how to do that? Where were my developers again? Who likes a good copy and paste? Who likes an even better button that says, do it for me? <laughs> Woohoo! All right. So that's why it is live, right? I am, okay. <laughs> I am allowed to click on this. So this morning, literally this morning, this very morning, the SLDS team launched a brand new thing for us. And this brand new, Oh, it was yesterday. Okay, yes. It actually was yesterday. But they changed the functionality on me from yesterday to today. All right. You know that thing, as anybody as a developer, you know that, what version are you using? Oh, I'm using version 3. Oh, dude, we're already on version 17. Yeah, but I just downloaded this this morning. I know, we're fast. That's them. Yeah. All right. So, what this allows me to do is to create a static resource that I can upload and use in my own component. So this is, I'm just going to go here into the field, and I'm going to say, Greg is, there it is. Greg is the best developer in the world. I think that is an awesome, awesome, in fact, I'm going to copy this just so I can remember it. All right, Greg is the best developer in the world. That's going to be my scope, right? 
So help me remember that. I'm just going to generate this and download it. So now what is happening is we are actually generating out a custom version of SLDS that I can use in my own components. Now, once that has downloaded, I'll just go and show this to you. It's right there. So I'm just going to move this out to my desktop, if I can find my desktop. Hello. All right, my desktop's hidden. Okay, it doesn't matter. All right, it's in the download folders. Remember, it's over here. Right here, it's called number one. Doesn't matter. All right, so it's called number one. We're going to use this by going back over here into my org. So I've gone into my org, and I'm now going to upload this static resource. So I'm going to say, in my setup, I'm just going to say static, and it'll take me right to static resources. And we can see I don't have any static resources, so I'm now going to say new, and I'm just going to call this uh, my CSS, my SLDS. There we go. We'll call it that. My SLDS. I will choose that file. I will go to my downloads. It's that first one right there. I'm going to open that, and I'm just going to upload that. I'm uploading the entire zip. I didn't have to touch it. I didn't have to open it. Didn't have to look at it. Don't care, right? So now that is going to upload, and once it is there, now that is available to me. And it is scoped to my SLDS, right? So, or it's actually scoped to Greg as the best developer in the world, which is obvious, right? But the name I'm going to use to refer to that resource is my SLDS, right? So now I can start building components, and I can build them actually for all of the above, right? All four instances, because the one I know I don't need SLDS, and the other I've got my static resource. So, who wants to build a component? All right, woo, all right, we're gonna build a component right now. Here we go. Now, if any of you are developers, you can appreciate live coding, all right? When you are live coding, this is scary, but all right, I'm gonna hope that I don't make any mistakes. I am going to start off by simply saying I would like to build a new Lightning component. That Lightning component, I am just going to call this um, my button component. Oops, ah, uh, let's just call it my button then. There, my button. Now, I'm going to use some of the new features here inside of uh, Summer 16. I'm just going to say I want to be able to use this across the board uh, within Lightning App Builder as well as Salesforce One and so on. I'll just hit Submit to have all of that stuff added there. Now, I'm going to do an H1. I'm going to say H1, hello world. All right, so here we go. Hello world. I'm going to save this. Immediately when I save this, this is available to me. Because now if I go back over here, let's say we were going to put this on a contacts page. And I was going to go in here and say, let's put this on my contacts page. And I'm going to do that by simply saying edit page. And in the edit page, I'm going to wait for, come on, wait for it. There we go. In the edit page, I'm going to wait for app builder to finally build. Come on. Is the Wi-Fi, who's on, oh, I'm not on hardline. Oh, well. Maybe I should be. Yes, I probably should be. All right, let's grab this and let's get on a hard line. Woo! Because all of you people are twittering about me right now and eating up all my. Oh no, there's it's it's there, but that's okay. I'll go here. All right. So, okay. So now I'm in App Builder. So what I want to do is I want to grab my component. What did I call it? My button. There it is, right there. Let's drag it and let's drop it. Let's put it right up here so that we can have it on our page. We'll save this. And when we'll go back over here and we'll look at this, come on, I'll stay on the page until you finish saying, all right, you saved. All right, now I'm going to back over, out over here so that I can actually see my component. Now, who here is a front-end developer and knows how big an H1 should be? <laughs> Not you. All right. That Hello World is the lousiest H1 I've ever seen in my life. Right? It should really be nice and big because H1 is the biggest heading that you can have in HTML. But as Steph told you earlier, she told you that she doesn't like you. You didn't hear that, but she actually did tell you that. She doesn't like you as developers just going, oh, that thing needs to be a little bit bigger, so I'll make it an H1. It's not supposed to be a bigger, or it's not supposed to be an H1 just because you want it bigger. Right? It's supposed to semantically mark things up. So I want to make my H1 bigger. Right? So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to head over to the Lightning Design System. So the Lightning Design System is going to show me what I need to do or talk to me about what I need to do. As we said, there's a whole lot of sections here. I'm going to go into the Components section. Now, going into the Components section, 
There are a lot of different things here in here that Steph was showing you sort of screenshots of. I sort of want to take you through some of these things. Um, for example, if we go to just something, uh, uh, let's go something like tabs. Tabs is a really neat example. So we have tabs, and here's those the, the tabs that we know and love from Salesforce Lightning Experience, right? And these all these these tabs, they're not just one type of tab, right? We have things like, oh, uh, what if I want an item to select? What is this going to look like? Oh, well, it's actually going to look like this. What if I have overflowing items? Oh, well, it's actually going to look like this. What if I have tabs that, are t tabs that are inside of tabs, right? So there's a lot of variations here. And you'll notice that as I was clicking on this, the, the HTML actually changed, right? The HTML is actually changing for me. So the first thing I want to do is obviously copy and paste some, some code. But I, when I do, please make sure to always scroll down here to the bottom. Because as you scroll down here to the bottom, you're going to find the component overview that she pointed out to you that is going to talk to you about what you need to do. Because as a developer, I have some bad news for you. The good news is SLDS is, is awesome. SLDS is the greatest thing since sliced bread. If I don't keep saying that, I don't get to go home. But it is agnostic, exactly. And SLDS is agnostic. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is the team wanted to build SLDS in a way that it, that it could be consumed using other tooling. So SLDS on the platform using Aura, wonderful. But what if I want to use React or Angular or something like that? Well. SLDS can be used there as well. So that's why they chose not to actually inject, if you will, JavaScript into the framework, but rather let you as the developer make the choice as to how you are going to work. So that would mean things like clicking on the tabs as I move from tab to tab. I'm going to need to add some code, some JavaScript, in whatever flavor I'm working in to actually switch that. And Inside of all of the, the uh, component overviews, you can see here's the JavaScript needs. So this is the class that you need to show or hide or add or do something to. Now, please remember, it's not just about JavaScript. There's also accessibility. Okay? When you're adding in JavaScript, you want to make sure that you keep these components accessible because they were built with accessibility in mind. We, we hold that as, a, as one of our main priorities at Salesforce, that things must be accessible. So there's also accessibility documentation. So before you just go willy-nilly copying and pasting, please make sure to go ahead and read that documentation. All right, so before I run out of time, let me go back over here and make a little change here. I'm, you know what? I'm going to do a quick change right here to my utility. I'm going to go down to my sizing. I'm going to say, hey, I want a little bit bigger text. So, oh, sorry, I wanted a text, not text sizing. Uh, let's go back down here. Uh, thank you, text. Thank you. All right. So I want a little bit bigger. I want that big, nice heading. So I'm just simply going to say, oh, look at that. There's a class I'm supposed to add. There's a class. It says SLDS text class uh, or text heading large. I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to say, let's add that to it. Boom, bing. All right, save that. And now if we go back over and we look at our Andy Young page, we refresh that. My hello world is now going to be nice and large. And by the way, that's one line of code in my component. I didn't have to do anything because I got SLDS for free. Now, let's use SLDS, though, in the other way, inside of a component that is being locked away, if you will. Let me start by doing that. I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to make a new, actually, I'm just going to replace this. Oh, you keep on using this my button component. So I'm going to do that by actually adding in a button. So let's go add in a button here real quick. Let's say button. And we're just going to go, and again, a button is great because it has all these different flavors. I'm going to use a neutral one, which is just um, the round one that looks like, or uh, sorry, a uh, clear one that looks like this, has a little frame around it. I'm going to use that. I'm just going to take this. I'm going to copy and paste this whole line of code. All right, back over here, paste, boop. All right, I have a button. Now, when you see this button, what I'm going to want that to do is to be able to click and launch a modal dialog, right? So I'm going to launch a, a, a modal dialog. So I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to see, let's get a modal dialog. Now, I'm just going to actually use the default. Why not? It's not very exciting, but we'll just do that. All right, let's grab that. Pink. Copy. And let's go back over here, and let's paste that in. Pink. All right, so now. 
The problem is I could go back to Andy Young's page and show you, and we all are, already know that things are working, but I wanted to show you what if I've got SLDS in a Visual Force page, in a uh, My App, or in uh, uh, using it in Lightning Out. How do I have to build? So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do a little trick here. Whoops, ah, hello. Oh, oh, that's right, you put it in an SVG, and I'm not, I'm not gonna use the SVG. I would need to actually go to do, um, you see they used an SVG for that close link, and in order to do that, I'd actually need to do a, a SVG helper, which is information on the, on the site, on the L SLDS site, um, for how to do that. I'm not gonna worry about that right now, because I've only got a couple minutes left to finish this component off. So, all right, so I've got my component, I've saved it, woohoo! but now let's go put this into a my.app, all right? I wanna show you a trick so that as you're building, your components can work in a my.app and on the platform all together at the same time. You wanna see that trick? All right, so here we go. All right, I'm first, I'm gonna start like this. I'm gonna say, let's actually go build a new app. All right, so this is my button app. All right, submit that, bing. All right, cool. Now I'm gonna go build one more component. I am going to say, this is going to be my lightning component, and this is going to be my SLDS component. All right. And I don't need anything else there. I'm just going to say that. All right. And now I'm going to go and hope that I have pasted. Oops, nope, wrong thing. Uh, let's see. There we go. All right. So I'm now going to change. What was the scope? What did I call it? No, that's what the scope was, but what was it called on the platform? I called it my SLDS, I tricked you, all right. Okay, so that's requiring my version that I just uploaded, that you saw me upload, all right? So that's in a component. Now, inside of this component, I'm gonna say div class equals, and then what we say, Greg is the best develop, what was it? Deve deve a developer in the world, I think. Is that what we said it was? I certainly hope so. All right, otherwise I'm gonna break open the CSS to check it. All right, there you go. Now, that is my scoping, right? That is my scoping that we were talking about. So it's gonna protect me because now I can actually put my button component, the one that we started with back over here, I can actually put my button in there. So I'm gonna say C colon my button. So that's going in there. All right, save all of this, and now let's put my SLDS component, oops, my SLDS component, this guy, into my button app. So we'll say C colon my SL, oops, my, my SLDS uh, component, right? Is what we call it? All right. I know, I know, okay. She's telling me I made a mistake. <laughs> no. I didn't make a mistake. All right, let's actually look back over here though to see if she was actually right. Oh, right there, ah, no. Yeah. All right, she was actually right. Shh, shh, don't tell her, okay? I'll never live it down. When I copied and pasted earlier, I was using a non-scoped version of, the, of SLDS. I'm actually using a lightning-scoped version of SLDS, so I need to add that on so I get the right CSS in the package that I uploaded as a static resource. <sighs> See, copy-paste for the win as long as you catch your mistakes. All right, so with all of that, I now hopefully can go back over here to my app and I can actually preview this and see, boom, oh, wow! I have SLDS modal headers and a button in there, but why did I get my modal on top already? Because I'm not the best developer in the world, right. That's exactly right, because I was silly enough to rely on copy and paste. 
Okay. As we said, we are completely agnostic here in, in building the framework. So what I need to do is I need to go back into wherever it was, whichever, I'm losing track of all my buttons. I need to go back in here and look at the fact that I've actually got this class, SLDS fade open, that, has, it, that is applied by default here. So I'm going to copy that, or actually copy it by removing it. There you go. Removing that from the modal. That's going to take the modal, and the modal is now no longer going to open by default. Then I'm going to scroll down here to the bottom where I have my backdrop, and the backdrop open is there as well. I'm just going to copy that out as well. So now I'm going to save that. Now if we were to go back and reload my component, now the, the modal would not even be there, but my button wouldn't work either. <laughs> right? So what I need to do is a quick, uh, um, a quick addition here to my button. So I'm going to go back up here on my button, and I'm going to say on click equals bink. Oops, on click equals bink. Hello. I can't type bink. There we go. All right. So on click equals, uh, let's uh, call it open modal. Open, uh, C, hello, C dot open modal. There we go. All right. And again, if you've never live coded in front of people, my heart is racing right now going, did you do it right? I'm hoping I did. All right, because now all I need to do is to finish this off. Let's save this. Let's go into our controller. Let's call this open modal. All right, and we are going to hope that we can say, oh, wait, I need one more thing. All right, first I need to go back over here to my modal, my modal right here, and I'm going to add in an ARIA role because I need to be able to find it. So I'm going to say ARIA colon ID equals, and we'll just call this wrapper. All right, help me remember that. And down here, this one, that backdrop is going to be called ARIA colon ID equals, and we're going to call this backdrop. All right, so with that, with my heart racing, I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to say var, and I'm going to say modal equals component dot find, bink, bink, and I'm going to find wrapper. And I'm going to say var back equals component dot find. And what I call it? Backdrop? All right. If I didn't, if I didn't, it's on you guys. All right. And then I'm just finally going to say dollar, dollar a dot util dot add class. And then I'm going to say paste number two there, the fade in. Oops, actually, I need to say what I'm doing it to first, modal, and then pink, fade in, open. There we go. And then one more, dollar a dot util dot add class. And we're going to say that's the back. And we're going to do pasting in that second thing. Uh, what was that backdrop open? There we go. All right. All right, my friends, the moment of truth has come. My heart is really racing right now. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you make sure that the life insurance is up to date? Okay. All right. Okay, we'll go ahead and load this. We did not get a modal. So far, so good. Here we go. Oh, ho, ho! Greg is the best developer in the world. But even cooler, if we go back over here and we refresh, Craig is the best developer in the world there, too. Woo! Is that cool? All right, so my friends, sadly, I'd love to keep coding live in front of you, but sadly, we're already out of time. Um, now, if you have questions for us, where, where's our, our campfire? Oh, I think the sunset campfire, we're going to go down there. We're going to break out the marshmallows and answer all of your lightning components and SLDS questions that you might have. All right. I'll be around the whole uh, um, uh, uh, sessions tomorrow. Um, if you're interested in, in learning how to build a, a context-aware lightning component, I'm doing a workshop again tomorrow, all right, a hands-on workshop. So we'll see you there. <laughs>